with our words and in our actions, let, let us praise, praise the, the living, living God. God. With our lips and in our lives, let, let us glorify, glorify the Lord. The Lord. Please join in the responsive prayer of praise and confession. Holy God, who calls the worlds into being, who calls us into Christ church, we thank you for the church that is our true home, for the mission of the church that is our true joy, for the ministry of the church that is our proper task. We thank you for the ministry of this denomination, for its faithful witness in the struggle for justice and peace, for its example in caring ways. We thank you for the ministry of the church in this place, for pastors and people who over time have praised your name and served your way. We thank you for the gifts of scripture and prayer, strong paths by which your spirit flows into the church. In our reading, in our praying, we yield ourselves to you. Open our senses to discern your will for us now. Refocus our mission and ready our gifts for ministry in the community and in the world. Gracious God, move us beyond ourselves, beyond any excuses, any resentments, any single-minded ways. Merciful God, forgive, renew, and guide us that we may become a resounding song of praise with all of the glory going to you. We pray in the name of Jesus crucified, the Lord of the church. Amen. My friends, hear this very good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And that promise is the power to love your neighbor and yourselves. The courage to be a community joined in faith, hope, and love. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 25, starting with verse 31. Listen for the word of the Lord. 
When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are the members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was thirsty and you gave me no food. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Like many of Matthew's parables, this one ends in judgment. It's awfully tempting to read this as some sort of test or an episode of Undercover Boss with Jesus as the CEO king roaming incognito through the world. But unlike many of Matthew's parables, this one is very clear in terms of what really is expected of those who would follow Jesus. The ones who got it right, the ones who were sheep rather than goats, they were the ones who took care of the people around them, not because there was something in it for them, not because they knew they would be making the king happy, but because they saw people in need and they tried to help. We see Jesus doing this throughout his ministry. And in fact, Luke tells us that Jesus' very first sermon was in Nazareth after he read these words from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And that's exactly what he did. Healing, feeding, forgiving, cleansing, setting free people who were in need. This shouldn't have been countercultural in his Jewish setting, Beyond Isaiah, the Hebrew scriptures contain many commandments and reminders to God's people that they, well, we, belong to each other. Even in exile, God expected them to care not just for themselves, but for their neighbors who were not Hebrews. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 9 says, 
the Lord, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Sounds like take care of yourselves. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. God's saying, yes, plant your gardens, feed your families. You're going to be there a while, so get married, have babies. But then God says, make sure the place that you're living is also thriving. Seek the good of the city, the neighborhood filled with people who are not your family, who don't look and sound just like you, who worship other gods and eat strange foods. Seek the good of those people too. As you create relationships, God says, good relationships with folks, you will all learn to love and to care for one another and all of you will be better off. So when Jesus eventually says that loving God and loving our neighbors are the two big commandments, the two primary ways we can understand all of the law and all of the prophets, he's really taking that love of neighbor very seriously. As the body of Christ in the 21st century, we need to do likewise. We need to be about the business of promoting social righteousness creating neighborhoods and movements that help neighbors and neighborhoods thrive. A little over a century ago, there was a progressive movement in the United States that sought to end problems like widespread poverty, the growing gap between rich and poor people, the exploitation of labor, a shrinking middle class, familiar problems that unfortunately have never quite gone away. And truth be told, they've been exacerbated by continued racial animosity and inequity. The church in that time responded to the progressive era through a related movement, the social gospel movement. It was during the progressive era and the social gospel movement that the Presbyterian church adopted those six great ends that we've been talking about for the last month or so, including the promotional promotion of social righteousness. Advocates of the social gospel worked hard to renew society, and they were convinced that Christians could and should take political action to advance the coming of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. That action is social righteousness. And it looks like this. The hungry are fed. The poor are lifted up. The naked are clothed. Those who are caught up in poverty, including the crime and poor health and lack of education and hopelessness that poverty engenders, are freed to live as God has always intended for all of us to live. The promotion of social righteousness takes us out of the sanctuary and into the streets, the halls of justice, and the polling places. And it moves us to seek the welfare of the city and nation in which we live and to love all of the neighbors who live with us here. I love the way that Bishop Desmond Tutu describes it. The social gospel, he says, is just the gospel period. When people were hungry, Jesus didn't say, now is that political or social? He said, I feed you because the good news to a hungry person is bread. This is a very 
active, a very practical gospel. And it is very good news to those who need it the most. My friend Erica and I talk a lot about how Jesus' teachings are a a solid bridge between my Christian faith and her Jewish heritage, particularly in the area of social righteousness and justice. She talks about it in terms of tikkun olam, or repairing the world through human actions. That's humanity's responsibility, our responsibility to change, improve, and fix our earthly surroundings is part of God's plan. Tikkunu Olam reinforces the importance of participating in tzedakah, which is justice and righteousness, and acts of loving kindness. Without our stake in the improvement of our environment, injustice and evil will continue to exist. Tikkun Olam requires people of all faiths to take ownership of and then to take action in our corner of the world to help love the whole world back into wholeness. The good news of God's grace is that the world doesn't have to be this way. This is what Jesus taught us This is what Jesus showed us. The even better news is that we don't have to wait for Jesus to come again because we, God's beloved children, are God's plan. You know, sometimes people ask me, Laura, I know that you love doing interim work and and that that's that's your call, but what, what would it take for you to be enticed into a settled call. Like, what kind of church would you want to be with? And it makes me think about a couple of animated mice from the early 90s in a show called Pinky and the Brain. Pinky and Brain, they're lab mice who live in the Acme Labs, a research facility. Brain is brilliant, self-centered, and scheming. And Pinky, he's good-natured, but not terribly bright. They make a great team. (laughs) At some point in every episode, they share this exchange. Pinky says, gee, Brain, what are we going to do tonight? And Brain says, same thing we do every night. Try to take over the world. I would love to be a part of a church where We get to the very end of a year and present our annual report and the session says to the congregation, so church, what are we gonna do this year? And the congregation knows exactly how to respond because they say in unison, same thing we do every year, try to repair the world. Yeah. May we, here and now, hear and respond to the call of the Spirit to care for the welfare of this city, of this nation, and to work to repair the world. Amen.
go into our prayer for the community and the world this week. I know that we carry many burdens, our own, our neighbors, our nations, and the world. And so I invite you to take just a moment to reflect on those blessings that you have seen in these last days, those moments that have lifted your spirits and made you smile. Let them buoy you, let them carry you, even as the Spirit carries us into a deeper prayer for our world. Let us pray. O oh Lord, how shall we pray? We are tired. God of this weary year, we are tired of going to bed exhausted and then taking hours to fall asleep or falling asleep quickly only to wake up about two in the morning and lying awake. We are tired of waking up worn out and dreading to turn on the news or open the door to grab the paper, knowing how the stories will wear us out. We don't know if we need more caffeine, more hope, more grace, more what, but we are tired. How shall we pray? We are tired, Jesus, of the deserted places. We are tired of not being able to go shopping and worn down by our fears of going into a store. We are tired of having to order everything delivered and then exhausted from wondering about the health and protocols of the delivery person. We are weary of the same people saying the same demeaning, distracting words, downplaying this crisis. And we are frazzled by those who ignore injustices. We don't know if we need more caffeine, more hope, more grace, more what, but we are tired. How shall we pray? We are tired, spirit of fresh winds and new lives. We are tired of people sharing foolishness on social media and irritated at ourselves for being sucked in by such posts. We are weary of those who care only for themselves, even as they proclaim great compassion for the sick and dying. We're exhausted by this weariness that won't go away, and we are worn down to the nubs of our soul by worry. We don't know if we need more caffeine, more hope, more grace, more what? But we are tired. We are tired. Lord of cancer, of bombs, of mistrust, we are tired of needing rescue. We are tired of being tired. But we are not tired of coming to you. And we are not tired of your grace in all of its beauty. And we will never tire of your faithfulness, your steadfastness. We will never tire of remembering your covenant to be with us. And of that presence that we experience in the midst of the storm and in the days that follow. Lord God, may our hearts and minds and bodies be strengthened by the memories and the stories and the truth of your steadfast faithfulness, of your healing, of your power of resurrection. God, we don't always know how to pray, but we know how to long. <laughs> we know how to lament. We know how to cry out because your spirit is within us and does those things for us. How shall we pray? 
I don't know if I need more caffeine, more hope, more grace, more what, but I know that we are tired. So God in community, God of community, holy three in one, hold us in our weariness. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we didn't know how to pray, we could say these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. have so much work to do so much to do don't you just know that that's what Jesus must be saying oh my dear friends <laughs> we have so much work to do and if we would just free up our hearts enough to experience the depths of God's love for us the riches of God's grace for us the washing over of the Spirit into us. We might have the strength to take one, two, three, five hundred steps today. And that is my prayer for you, my friends, that you would know and experience the riches of God's grace and hope and peace and love this day so that you might Find your hands so overflowing with all of that, that it runs out to your neighbors, your family, and your friends. Amen.